good morning, Jesus loves you. That last song was so good, and it goes with my sermon today, so good. My, the name of my sermon is God is Powerful to Save, and amen? Is that true? Yeah. Amen. God is powerful. Miss, Miss Rhonda, it's good to see you here today, too. Praise the Lord. Well, we got, we got some people who've been out ill, and we got some people who have been here who are not here, so we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. I don't know if there's much more for me to say today, besides my sermon. That'll only take two or three hours, but um, uh, let's see. Oh, tailgating party coming right up. And I want you to know that Bill's fixing some barbecued ribs. And if you've never had his barbecued ribs, you're missing something. You need to be here for that. Praise the Lord. Amen, Bill? Amen. I, I agree. I know I like them. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be here. <laughs> There's no doubt. I might not be here all night, but I'm going to be here at rib time. I praise the Lord. God is so good. Amen. We have a beautiful day outside. It, it, it's like in the 70s. It's like, you know, people move to Hawaii and spend millions of dollars to get wet weather like this. And God gave it to us today for free. God is powerful to save. Joshua, the story is found in Joshua chapter 2, mainly. That's where we'll be. And we'll be in Hebrews 11.31. You don't have to turn there, but I will quote it, and the verses will be on the board. And I want you to know that the message of the Bible is very clear. God loves you, and He is the one who has the power to save you. He is the God who is powerful to save. Amen? I want to look at someone today. We've been preaching about the women of the Bible, and I have found it very uh, uplifting looking at the lessons that these women have taught us. And some of them were queens, and some of them weren't. Some of them, like today, wasn't even an Israelite. But let's look at, the, let's look at Abraham, the father of faith, and the father of the nation of Israel. His descendants could not have been more of a dysfunctional family. I mean, if you really read about them and read about the things they did, you know they were messed up. They were liars and cheats and thieves, and they were at the least, at the very least, but God loved them and gave them many second chances at new life. And, and they attained. But our number one problem is our foe, Satan, his favorite tactic is to make us doubt ourselves. He wants us to doubt our salvation. He mainly wants us to doubt in God, but he does it by getting us to doubt in ourselves. He loves to remind us of where we came from. We all came from the same place. We were all sinners. And what we used to be, you did it this time, he'll whisper in your ear, God can never love you or forgive you. Man, that is the biggest lie that has ever been told. You did it, whatever it is, whatever he echoes in your mind, adultery, pornography, drug, abuse, lies, whatever it was, you fill in the blank for your life, and he will tell you that God could never forgive you for that sin. And that, that is just the furthest thing from the truth. Don't give up on yourselves. Don't give up on the dysfunctional family that you may have come from or may not have. I don't care what you've done or what you may be doing. You are not beyond God's grace. Amen? You just As, as long as you're even contemplating God, you're, you're, you're within His area of grace. There is nothing so broken that God can't restore it to new life. Satan wants you to believe you're finished, but in the eyes of God, your life is just beginning and has unlimited possibilities. One of the things I've been telling David, and, and I truly believe it, whatever it is that God has for you, no matter how out of this world it might seem, in, through Jesus Christ, you can accomplish it. Now, I think many times we fall short of what God has for us because we get off on this trail of sin and we miss the mark so many times. But anything is possible with God. I really, truly believe that. 
Jesus is the God of new beginnings and second chances, and God has a new life for you, but you, you must do one thing. You must believe, and you must reach out and take it by faith. Amen? I don't care how many times you failed. I don't, don't ever give up on Jesus. His grace and mercy, they have no limits. Today we're going to look at a woman who was a terrible sinner. She was a foreigner and she was the enemy of Israel. Her name was Rahab and by profession she was a prostitute. She lived in Jericho. Jericho was the first city that the Israelites came to after they crossed the Jordan River. God told the Israelites that he would have, give them the land and to totally conquer and destroy all who lived there. He, they were to kill everyone, leave no one. Now, I know some people have a hard time with that, but if you really get into the God's purpose, you know it was for good. Joshua 2.1 says, Then Joshua the son of Nun, who was leading Israelites at that time, sent, secretly sent two spies from Shadim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute and they made Rahab and stayed there. Well, you know, some people would say, well, what were they doing with the prostitute? Well, they, they weren't doing anything with the prostitute. But if you go to a strange city and you want to stay there and remain anonymous, that's where you go, to the house where men go, and no one will suspect anything. Joshua was doing what any good military general would do. He was gathering intelligence for the upcoming battle. Joshua chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent his message to Rahab, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the land. The king of Jericho was pretty nervous about that time. He could look over the walls of Jericho and see the two million Israelites just on the other side of the Jordan River, and he knew when they crossed there was going to be a big battle. And he had heard what the Lord had done. Verse 4 and 5 tells us that Rahab, instead of turning the spies in, she hid them. Joshua, verse 2, verses 4 and 5. But the woman had taken the two men in and hidden them, she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gates, they left. I didn't know which way they went. Go after them quickly and you may catch them. She wasn't an Israelite. She didn't believe in the God of Israel. She didn't believe in what the Israelites believed in. In fact, I don't believe she was religious at all because of her chosen profession. Morals were not high on her less of priorities. To the Israelites, she was the worst of the worst, and by law, she deserved to be stoned. She was unworthy, but Rahab's life is a picture of God's salvation. Look at it. She was a foreigner, not an Israelite. Strike one. She was a sinner, a prostitute. That breaks about half of the Ten Commandments when you think about it. Fornication, adultery, lust. And if you're a prostitute, you're probably going to lie about it a time or two. Strike two. And she was numbered with the transgressors. The Israelites were commanded by God to destroy Jericho and all of its inhabitants. Strike three, you're out. She didn't have a chance. But she had heard about the God of Israel, and she believed. Belief is the key to pleasing God. Belief and faith are exactly the same thing, except when you put your belief into faith, it turns into action. Faith is an action word. It takes action. It takes action. The news of what God did in Egypt had 40 years to travel across the desert. You know, he had parted the Red Sea and brought them out of Egypt in the most powerful way. Look at Joshua 2, 9. J Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And this is where we see the secret of Rahab's salvation. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen over us so that all who lived in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what he did in 
Shihon and Ord, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. The Lord your God is God of heaven above and on earth below. That, that, that's a powerful, powerful verse there, set of verses. If we just look at what she said, the first four words of verse 9 and the last seven or eight words of verse 11, she says, I know that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. And in between, she fills in all the reasons why she has become a believer. She says, I know that the Lord is God in heaven and on earth below. I've heard, I've heard what the Lord has done. Rahab was a Canaanite, a mortal enemy of the Israelites. She was the most unlikely candidate for God's grace. But Rahab is a picture of God's amazing grace and salvation. What made the difference in Rahab's life? Listen to her words in Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. We heard of it. Our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Think back. I don't know if your salvation experience was like mine, but if you think back to it, I think this might ring a bell. When I first heard the gospel, and my heart melted in fear, because, man, I thought, you know what? That pastor's talking about sinners, and I'm one of them, and he's saying they're going to go to hell, and that must be where I'm going. So my heart melted, but thank God, the pastor kept talking and told me about God's grace and how it was for everyone and no one was excluded. And I believe she says everyone's courage melted when they heard what God had done. And she believed in what the Hebrew God had done. She had heard and she believed. Rahab had heard. In fact, all the people in Jericho had heard what God had done. What makes Rahab different is that she heard and believed and put her faith in God and acted on it and hid the spies. Now, she didn't put her trust in Jesus because Jesus wasn't around then, right? She couldn't put her. All she did was put her faith in God. That's all she could do. That's all she knew to do. She heard what God had done and she acted on it. There were a lot of people in Jericho they had all heard about this God. Their hearts had melted too, but they refused to believe. They didn't let the good news of the gospel change their lives. They didn't change the way they live. They just kept right on going. I'll bet Satan was trying to get Rahab to doubt what she had heard. You see, whatever your past has been it was no worse than Rahab's present. It was no worse than Rahab's life. So many people start off on the Christian race running to win the race and then they slip up and the guilt associated with the sin and the accusations of Satan cause, us, cause them to believe that God doesn't love them anymore. And after a while, some of them just quit coming to church. We all know people who used to come here and they don't come here anymore. God wants you to know that no matter how dark the sin might be, God's amazing, amazing grace is greater than it all. Amen? I want you to know that God's grace is greater than your sin, more powerful than your sin. No matter how big the giant you may face may be, no matter how big the obstacle in your path is, it may seem to appear to be the tallest mountain or the widest river but I guarantee you, God can make a way where there is no way. God is powerful to save. He can save you. It doesn't matter what's in your future. God has a way. The truth is, is that the Apostle John told us in John 8, 32, that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And I believe we could add two words to that. I know you got to be careful when you add words to Scripture, but I believe it can say that when you know the truth and believe, the truth will set you free. 
When you believe that God is the God of heaven and earth and you act on it in faith, the truth has set you free. John 3.16 says, For the God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It says, whoever believes. Now, what it means to believe in God and act in faith, that's different in every individual's life. But you have to believe. Somewhere along the line, there has to be some action. You have to believe and take action to move towards God. God's grace is greater than all Rahab's sins, and God's grace is greater than all of our sins. You were not created by God to be thrown on the junk mile of humanity. Listen to the first Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's salvation has always been part of the plan. In fact, it's not just the plan. It's the de destination. It's crossing the victory. It's the victory itself. God's plan is to get us to heaven. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. God, it's always been God's plan before time begun to save his children out of sin. He knew what was coming. And he had a plan. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Death is the result of what we do. It's our wages, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. I've had people tell me, but, but Jesus could never forgive me. In fact, I've told you, my mom spoke those very words. And I told her, I said, Mom, it's never about what we do. It's always about what Jesus did. And if you believe in it, you are saved already. When sa Satan whispers in your ear that, the unre that you're unredeemable, shout back at him, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Has the blood been applied to your life? Then you're redeemed. When God gives, forgives you, you become a child of God. Believe it, sing it, shout it, and live it out. Amen? When Satan knocks on the door, send faith to answer it, and Satan will run away like a little schoolgirl being picked on by a big bad bully. Now, excuse me, ladies, if you take offense that I said a little schoolgirl. It could be a little schoolboy, too. But James 4, 7 tells us, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? When you invoke the name of Jesus, it literally hurts Satan's ears. He don't like the word of God, and he does not like us standing on it. Satan can't stand the truth of God's word. He hates it when we invoke the name of Jesus. Back to Rahab, her decision to put her faith in God turned her whole life around. Joshua 6.25, but Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And then comes this next sentence to me is one of the most unusual sentences in the whole Bible, and it, and it says, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now, man, now think about it. Is, do you think Rahab's still alive? You think if we went to Israel, we could find Rahab over there somewhere? We could look her up in the, on the internet and find her house and go and visit her? Well, no, we know she's not alive in Israel today. Amen? She's not. Those Israelites aren't alive in Israelite today. In fact, almost all of them perished because of disobedience. But it says she lives among the Israelites to this day. Well, who are the Israelites? They're God's people. And where do the departed people of God live? Heaven. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. <laughs> 
by faith, Rahab was not just saved physically, but she was saved spiritually. She lives in heaven today. That's what that sentence tells us. And how do we know? How can we confirm that Rahab was saved? Just listen to Hebrews 11.31. Rahab, uh, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, I want, you know, some people might say, well, that just means she lived. Well, I want you to go and read chapter 11 in Hebrews and see how many times it talked about people who didn't make it to heaven. Amen? I believe, I believe completely that Rahab took all she knew about God and acted on it in faith, and she was saved spiritually. If you look in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Rahab's name is found in the genealogy of, of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever read that someone felt saved. You never read about, oh, I'm King David and I feel saved today. No, you never read about someone feeling saved. Rahab believed and was saved. She was the least likely person in the story to be saved, but because she believed, she was saved. Because she believed by faith that the Israelites' God was the God in heaven above and on earth below, she became a believer. Today, people hear about Jesus all the time. But do they believe enough to change the direction of their life by acting on what they've heard? People say, oh, that was a long time ago. If Jesus was coming, he'd be here by now. Well, I want to tell you something. One of these days, Jesus is going to be here. And all those people are going to wish they had believed. It had been 40 years since God had dried up the Red Sea, but Rahab still believed and she was saved and all the other people in Jericho perished. The only ones that were saved was her family. Her family. Out of all the hundreds of thousands of people that lived there, only her and her family lived. Weak, unstable Christians are controlled by their feelings and fears. And God doesn't want that to be part of our lives. They say things like, well, I don't feel saved. That's just what Satan wants you to feel. Reject that feeling in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a lie. Everyone has days when they feel they, they, they're not saved. There are days when I don't feel saved. You know, Pastor, you? It sure is. There's been times when I've left this pulpit and I thought to myself, God, if I was you, I would fire me. Now, please, if you felt the same thing, don't tell me, okay? Don't say, you know, Pastor, I, I felt that same thing a few times. People say, I don't feel led to give towards to give to the God, God's kingdom. Well, tightwads usually don't. God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take from a grouch too. People say, God doesn't lead me in the way I should go. And I've asked some of them, well, have you read the Bible? And they say, yes. Well, then God has led you because the Bible is full of God's word on how we should live our lives. It's not, they're not suggestions. They're commands. Do this. Don't do that. Faith is not about how you feel. It's about the truth and what you believe enough to obey. And when you act on the word of God because you believe, then and only then does it become saving faith. Faith is the difference between saying, oh Jesus, that, that story sounds good to me. It makes my heart warm. And saying, Jesus, I heard what you did for me. I believe and please forgive me for my sins and help me to live for you. Amen? We're not always perfect. We don't always make the right decisions, but we're trying our best to do what God wants. And if we do that, then we're covered by the blood. Rahab believed and she acted on her beliefs. She hid the spies and by doing so, she put her faith in God. I don't think the king would have been very happy if she, he had discovered Rahab's treason. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The blessings of obedience, amen? I've been speaking about that for a few weeks now, bringing out this, this that when we obey, not because of what we have done, God blesses us because of who he is. He loves us. He wants us to be blessed. He wants your life to look so good that the people around you can look at you and say, hey, Bill, what's different about you? And then Bill can say, well, it's Jesus. He, he just loves me. He blesses me. I don't deserve it. He just does. James, Jesus' half-brother, said, but when you ask you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That push person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. James chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. It's clear. Don't, be, don't allow your life to be driven by the winds of feelings and the waves of the ocean. Amen? If you live by feelings, it's going to be harder. Hear this, let the word of God be the guiding truth in your life and the Holy Spirit be the wind that fills your sails and drives your life along. The truth of God hidden in your heart is powerful and rewarding. You may say, but pastor, you, you don't know how much trouble I've had in my life. And, and that's true. I, I doubt if I do. But trouble will either cause you to lean on your faith or abandon it. If you're a Christian, you will lean into God and you will trust him. And if you're not, trouble is what will separate you from God and lead you astray. Without the trouble God allowed into the lives of those we read about in the Bible, the people we read about today, we would have never known of God's miraculous power. Right? Amen? Trouble always comes before one of God's miracles. Are you experiencing trouble in your life today? Then you may be the very next person to experience a miracle from God. Everybody has troubles. When your troubles cease, take a good look around and you'll find that you're already in heaven. Because that's the only place I know where you, hit, where you don't have any trouble at all. Amen? You see, what you believe enough to act on means every Thing to God. God tests us. He, he, he gives us rules. Don't do this. Do that. And if we don't do this and we do that, he says, that's one of mine. I'll bless that child. And he blesses everybody. He sends the rain and the sunshine on everybody. But he blesses his children much more. Paul said in Romans 2.27, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. It's those who obey the law because they believe who go to heaven. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. God does not expect you to be perfect on this side of heaven. But he does expect you to be trying. If, the, if you can say the sincere purpose of my life is to please God in all I say and do, even though sometimes I'm not perfect, but what I want to do is please God, then you're on your way to heaven. That's what makes a difference to God. It's not what you believe. It's what you believe enough to obey that counts. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. It says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I will give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations on earth, and all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Now, just before that, in, in chapter 27, God had listed all the things that the Israelites could count on, all the things he would do for them if they would obey. And then God says, if you will obey, all these things will come on you and be with you if you will just obey. Verse 2 in Deuteronomy verse 2 is not a very accurate translation of the original language, but in the King James Version, verse 2 is excellent. 
And it reads like this, all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now that word hearken is simple. It means that we believe and we act on it. We just don't believe, but we believe and we live our life by it. And it says, and all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. That, that, the picture there is like a dam breaks and the water is rushing down through the valley and it just overtakes the town. And when you're in that town, you're just, you're just overwhelmed by the water. And that's what God says. You'll be overwhelmed by these blessings if you will just obey. Going back to verse 1, it says, And the Lord will set you high above all the nations on earth. Why does God do that? Why does God set his people high above? Just stay at what I told you earlier. He wants your life to be so blessed that all the other people will say, Hey, what's different about them? The problem is, is that so many of us have such a hard time obeying. And when we don't obey, we don't tell anybody about God's wonderful grace in forgiving us. We don't want to fess up, oh yeah, I did this or I did that and the Lord saved me again. His, his blood washed away my sins. No, we'll do that the first time, won't we? We'll get up and we'll say, hey, hey God saved me. But after that, we kind of keep it on the down low because we don't want anyone to know we messed up. And I'm not just saying you all, everybody's like that. <laughs> and then there's so many people who say, I'm a Christian, and they don't live for God at all. So the Christians can't look different. We can't be set above all the other nations. Because there's so many people who go to church every once in a while. They say they love God, but where are they at? How would you like the Lord's blessing to overtake you like a flood water from a broken dam? Then obey God's word. There is great blessing in obedience. Great blessing. Listen to Jesus in Luke eleven twenty eight. Blessed rather are those who hear the word and obey it. God blesses everyone. His grace is always there for us. But when you obey his word, there is so much more blessing to follow. And we don't obey because we're blessed. We're blessed because we obey. Amen? As God's children, we must believe, Hebrews eleven six. we must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Doesn't mean we always hit the nail right on the head. Doesn't mean we're always perfect. Doesn't mean we always get the will of God perfect in our lives. But what it does mean is that's the desire of our heart is to always do the right thing. And when we mess up, we say, Lord, <laughs> I'm sorry. I messed up again. Forgive me. And when you do that, what do you find? That his blood is sufficient to wash away your sin. God's grace was greater than Rahab's sin, and it's greater than ours. There's no life so broken that God can't heal it. Never stop believing in God. Exercise your faith. Read God's word and live it out in every way that you can. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want to tell you something. When you get that crown, you'll be in heaven because that's the only place, that's the only place you can find it. The crown of life. Not just life, but it's eternal life. Let's determine in our minds and in our hearts to persevere for God. Amen? God, God's on our side. We have all the power. We have all the resources of heaven at our, at our disposal. I have 
people, th this is, I'm able to lead it for you because <laughs> she's translating into Spanish for Maria. And um, uh, I'm able to Sometimes people come to me and they talk to me and they say, you know, Lord, not Lord. They say, Larry, the Lord's going to, all these things that's going to happen in Revelations, all these terrible things that are going to happen, all these hard times, what are we going to do? Well, for one, I firmly believe that when all those hard times comes, that all God's people will be in heaven. I believe the rapture is going to happen right before the tribulations, and that will happen. But let's say I'm wrong. There's no definite verse in the Bible that says 100% that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. And let's say I'm wrong. I want you to know that your God is powerful to save. He saved the Israelites out of Egypt. He saved the Hebrew children out of the fiery furnace. He saved Daniels out of the lion's den. And he saved Rahab, the only family in Jericho. See, when God decides that you're saved, you're saved and it don't matter where you're at. Jericho was completely destroyed and burned. Everything was burnt. And all the people died. I, I, I heard a guy on the radio not too long ago, and, and you can go to Jericho today. It, it's just a mound in the desert. But they've excavated it, and, they've, and everything they find says that what the Bible says about Jericho is true. When, when you go to a city that was taken over by force, the walls are pushed in. But when you go to Jericho, it looks like the walls fell down because of an earthquake. Because that's, the Lord brought the walls down, not the Israelites. And it was burnt by fire. It was totally destroyed. The only thing they kept was the gold and the silver, and they put that into the treasury of God. And then the only other thing that came out was Rahab and her family. I want you to know that you don't have to worry about your future. God has a plan, and you're already part of it. Amen? You're already part of it. He already has it all worked out. And all you have to do is follow and trust him. And he will lead you home to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. And we'll close in prayer. And we'll go our merry ways. Lord Jesus, I pray that out of your glorious riches, in heaven, that you would strengthen us with power through the, your spirit in our inner beings so that the Lord Jesus would dwell in our hearts through faith so that we may live a life that's rich in faith and action. It's what Paul says, faith and action, because faith without action is dead and see your will done in our lives and in the lives of our church. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do, and we pray, Lord, that you would go with us this week and bless us and protect us and lead us and guide us in your paths of righteousness for your namesake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, each one of you, amen.